Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our meeting uh, on the struggle for trans liberation. Um, this is a meeting of the International Socialists, a revolutionary socialist organization committed to building socialism from the bottom up. Uh, we publish a newspaper every month called The Socialist. And in the June edition, uh, we wrote three articles concerning trans liberation, healthcare, and far right governments. And today, in the wake of protests uh, for the transformation of transgender healthcare, we have a panel here today with uh, two speakers and also including myself. Um, and um, during uh, the first part of this meeting, uh, the panel will provide an introduction, a uh, socialist introduction to the struggle for trans liberation in the Netherlands and uh, a bit more of an international perspective. And then after this uh, introduction from the panel, there will be the opportunity for an open discussion in uh, the Zoom call. Um, I will explain how the discussion will be structured after the introduction. Um, but first, I would like to ask the speakers from the panel to introduce themselves. Um, Emmy, would you go first? Yes, sure. Sorry, I just had to find the unmute button. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emmy. I use they them pronouns. I'm from the UK, but currently based in Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, which is where I'm active as an activist as well. So I'm also part of the International Socialists. Um, and aside from that, I'm quite active in activism, focusing on a range of social justice issues, mostly uh, queer feminism and anti-racism, and of course, trans liberation. And from a personal perspective, I'm connected to this topic because, well, I'm non-binary. Um, I've also tried and failed and given up of using the gender-based care um, system in the UK. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Lane? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lane. I use they them pronouns. I'm also based in Groningen right now. I am also active here as an activist in uh, Queer Pride Groningen and in the uh, Groningen Feminist Network. So that's also mostly like a uh, Queer feminism, and uh, I'm a trained designer and researcher. And lately, I've been trying to incorporate like my uh, personal experience more with my professional practice. So, doing like feminist design, especially in terms of like social design, narrative design, um, trying to work more on that. And uh, yeah, my connection to the topic is like partly through my activism, but also um, through a personal like experience of being a non-binary person. And currently going through the um, yeah the transition system in uh, Groningen in order to get surgery, so I will talk a bit more about that in a bit. Thanks so much, Lane. Um, then finally, myself. My name is Emma Young. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Um, I am a member of also the Groningen branch of the International Socialists. Um, and with that, um, I would like to start off our introduction by quickly mentioning uh, some of the context of the developments, uh, developments around the struggle, struggle for trans liberation in the Netherlands. Um, so really, um, generally, the Netherlands has a pretty shameful track record when it comes to trans health care. In uh, 1985, the so-called transgender law was instated, which forced people into sterilization if they wanted to uh, legally change their gender. Um, and only in 2014 was this criminal law abolished. Um, in 2019, the transgender collective in the Netherlands moved to address these harms and secured a financial compensation for um, those who transitioned during uh, the time that this law was active. But this uh, is by far not enough to really make trans healthcare uh, sufficient in the Netherlands. Um, so recently, uh, the healthcare minister Van Ark expressed a form of rejection of the approval inspection that is now necessary for getting healthcare. Um, but even still, uh, decisions about trans people's bodies are being made not by trans people themselves, but by these formal institutions that perpetuate the exclusion and uh, mistreatment in uh, healthcare. So in June this year, a new group was brought into existence called Transzorg Nu, um, 
This group and movement has a very strong offensive attitude with strong demands for the transformation of trans healthcare um, in its totality. And some of their demands are no waiting lists, no diagnoses and total self-determination. Um, I would believe there uh, is someone present, uh, well, someone will be present in the discussion later who has been part of organizing for the Transfer New Demos. So uh, hopefully uh, he can tell us more about that later. Um, and one element that also helped spark the current protest was the coming to be of the Instagram page called Fu uh, Gender Mistreatment, where the stories of people who experienced this exclusion, discrimination, and maltreatment at the uh, VUMC in Amsterdam. Um, so now to really kick off the panel, um, Lane, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the current state of trans healthcare in the Netherlands? Yes, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, so for everybody who is like not familiar with the, with the general system, like if you're seeking to medically trans transition in the Netherlands, that you will usually um, contact a gender team, like no matter where you are in the Netherlands, and you will like work with this gender team throughout uh, your medical transition. And um, also no matter where you are in the Netherlands, like usually this process is uh, divided into three stages, which is like firstly a diagnostic, diagnostic stage where you will talk to the gender team about um, how you relate to your gender, how you relate to your body, um, and a bunch of other things about your life, basically your uh, disclosing a lot of personal information to a psychologist in this stage. And then the next stage is um, potentially getting hormones if you want that, and what they call social transitioning, so that you uh, quote unquote live as your gender like in public um, for a while. And then the final stage is um, like having surgeries again if you want that. And depending on where exactly you are and what exactly you want, uh, that process can look a bit differently. Like for example, I didn't want hormones, so I skipped that step. I also was already like out to a lot of my environment when I like entered into the, uh, yeah, the trajectory with the medical gender team here. So I could, um, yeah, I could skip that part as well. Like I didn't have to like uh, do a social transition in, in company with them. But um, yeah, like something that, the, uh, the movements that Emma has listed rightfully point out is that there are a lot of issues with all of these steps, basically, especially the first two ones. So the way that the gender teams are usually framing it is as like, your wishes come first, we're just here to support you. We want to make really sure that you get what you need. We want to make sure that you do not have any regrets in the end, um, and we're just supporting your discovery process. But uh, yeah, in practice, a lot of trans people experience that very differently, where especially the part of, we want to make sure that you don't have any regrets um, in practice and often looks like that you're getting asked a lot of very basic questions because they want to make sure that, you, uh, that you're not just confused, that you know what you're doing, that you're not making decisions based on mental illness or neurodivergence or trauma. But that can be very problematic because a lot of trans people have faced trauma and have faced uh, like mental illness and are neurodivergent. And then it becomes very difficult to disentangle like which part of your of your yeah, identity um, is your transness and which part is like based on your history. Like you cannot take a person apart like that, right? So um, yeah, often then you have to ask, uh, has to answer really invasive questions. You have to tell people about your, um, yeah, your, your choices regarding to your body, about your sexual activity, about your masturbation uh, practices, um, which can be really traumatic for a lot of people. So like under the guise of making sure that you don't make decisions based on trauma or something like this, people are actually like actively traumatizing you. And there's little space in this process to actually explore the kind of questions or doubts you as a trans person might have. Um, because there's so much focus on like you having to prove that you're actually trans and that you're making decisions based on the transness that many people are scared to like even admit that maybe they do have doubts or that they do have questions because there is this very clear power imbalance that you're not in this space where you're just like having the space to explore but in the end you know that the person that you're talking to the psychologist and the psychiatrist that you're talking to they will make a decision on whether or not 
you're allowed to get hormones and whether or not you can have surgery. So um, you can also see that if you read the stories under the Instagram account that Emma mentioned of the uh, value gender mistreatment, like so many people feel at one point that they are pushed into something that they did not want out of fear of being denied treatment later or of being misinformed about their options. And that is a very common experience, like no matter where you are, like whether you're at the VU or whether you're at the UMCG or at other gender teams, like basically this pattern is always the same, that there's this idea of you want to make sure that you don't have any regrets. But in that process, people are like grossly misunderstanding um, the kind of needs that trans people have. And in the end, you sort of have this frustrating experience that you see that a lot of resources go into things that you might not need, where I could see that for myself, where I was almost for one year in this diagnostic part where I kept having discussions with people about how I feel about my body and how I feel about like my relation to my gender. And at that point I had already figured that out. So I did not need that kind of therapy. So that was a waste of resources, but the things that I would have liked to know were about the medical realities of transitioning. And that did not, like there was no space for that. So that then feels that they keep telling you, this is for you, but you feel like, no, this is for you. I have to just prove to yourself. I just have to prove to you um, that I should be allowed to have this like surgery that I want or the kind of medical care that I want. And that is, yeah, that is not an individual experience. That is something that happens a lot. And uh, yeah, so for a lot of people, this is an experience where you feel very um, infantilized, like your agency is sort of like stripped away from you. Like it's assumed that you don't know what you're doing. There's a lot of gaslighting going on where a lot of people are, are not only being suggested but like i would rightly get accused of being like oh no you you are just wrong you're not trans this is not why you want this but this is because of the trauma that you have experienced or because of this mental illness you have or because of this uh, neurodivergency that you have and that of course can be very triggering and very unsafe for a lot of trans people because you have to be vulnerable in this space and then you you get confronted with this kind of ignorance so um yeah in, uh, in conclusion, I would say that by now it is possible to get more care than a couple of years ago under very specific circumstances, but there's still a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. And it also really depends on you as a person. Like if you already know what you want, it can be a lot easier. But if you're somebody who's trying to figure things out, who's maybe still like exploring or who is maybe presenting in their gender in a way that doesn't confirm with the, like correspond to the stereotypes that the people in this gender team have, um, then you're also in a lot of more trouble because they still run on this outdated idea of, um, yeah, like trans being uh, about having the wrong body and being born in the wrong body and that you like want to be a gender that you are not. So uh, yeah, if you're, for example, a trans man who is presenting quite feminine, um, then, you, then you also get in trouble because they doubt your transness a lot. Yeah, so I think that would be um, the short summary of that situation. Thanks very much, Lane. Um, yeah, so it sounds like apart from, you know, the many things we hear about long waiting lists and also people's um, kind of treatments being put on hold for no good reason at all and not being informed, there's also this kind of forcing people into, into a kind of binary um, and gender expression that maybe doesn't fit them at all. Um, uh, anything else uh, you would like to add on that topic or Emmy? Right. Um, then I wanted to relate this a bit to the political landscape of the Netherlands right now, specifically the far right. Um, you know, I think that we can see in the Netherlands, but also abroad, that the far right is one kind of driving force behind um, what allows these mistreatments kind of to happen in institutions. And I think one main way that the far right does this is by trying to derail the discourse on this topic, the kind of public debate. Um, the far right tries to actively lobby to take away the kind of few securities that trans and queer people have in the society. Um, because it seems that people often speak about the Netherlands as if we are some kind of example for other countries or contexts when it comes to trans rights. But actually, it seems that the whole kind of political landscape keeps sliding to the right and things are really going not in the right direction at all. Um, so the Fefe Day, 
as expected, has a kind of neoliberal approach to uh, trans rights. You know, it's an individual matter, and therefore, you know, it should only be available to the people who have sufficient resources to acquire the kind of care for themselves. But then there's more outspoken groups like uh, the FEDA, who uh, openly, for example, oppose the ban on sexual conversion therapy, um, you know, which has the aim of curing homosexuality. Um, they openly oppose banning this. Um, and uh, this kind of runs parallel to uh, this emerging transphobic narratives that have come up in recent years uh, of uh, solutions of gender conversion therapy. So curing kind of this condition uh, as they would put it. Um, and uh, this kind of is in the same line as how previously um, the far right in the Netherlands have used gay rights to kind of attack Muslims um, and Muslim communities. But we see that this facade is, you know, completely fall away as trans people are explicitly targeted um, by the far right. Um, and it's also interesting to link this to the fact that we see the far rights increasingly kind of merge with um, conservative Christians and that these groups kind of seem to share some aims and strategies. Um, and I think what we can, we can very abstractly kind of understand the far right as trying to play on kind of people's desire for this idealist image of a mythical and unified past of, 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 of a unified people, which, you know, can only come about again by violently imposing a kind of purity or an ideal on, on people. Um, and I think that in, uh, in their attack on uh, trans people, their strategy often to um, violently impose this kind of purity, their strategy is to question really the possibility of trans identities and thereby undermine the demands, the concrete demands made by trans people. You know, so they call it gender ideology or genderism to act as if it's all just made up and needs to be justified in one way or another. Um, but really, I think this is just another way to reinforce strict gender norms and conservative politics. Um, and the really frustrating thing is that this debate is picked up time and time again by the media, perpetuating a question that isn't a question at all. Um, so that in the Netherlands, but also, you know, internationally, we see that far right governments are, uh, are uh, launching attacks on trans people, um, specifically in, in Hungary, the limiting of LGBTQIA rights and also uh, prohibiting trans people from having their gender legally recognized. And in Poland, where trans people have to sue their parents to have their gender legally recognized. And of course, also we see that under Bolsonaro and Trump, this kind of fascist governments that um, more, uh, more transphobic violence uh, got the chance to kind of rise up. Um, so, so far my kind of interjection about the far right. Um, we see uh, this transphobia in all kinds of capitalist right-wing countries. And I was hoping uh, that one of you can say something about how the oppression of trans people kind of relates to other kinds of oppression under capitalism. Um, maybe Lane, would you like to say something about that? Um, yes, I can. Like, I would like to start with talking about how gender, um, like the construction of gender itself, but specifically the gender binary like dates back to a colonial project basically and how we can still see the traces of that very much today and the kind of tendencies that you just described where um, yeah gender basically uh, was uh, was constructed in the late 19th earliest 20, early 20th century um, in the context of yeah this colonial project of establishing white people and whiteness as superior to everything else um, in order to justify the theft of land and resources and the destruction of culture, uh, cultures and peoples. And so basically, um, one way that people were trying to do that was through racist science, through eugenics, 
where you had this this theory that one way in which um, the like white race was superior to all others was that uh, the two sexes were like most distinguishable uh, in in them, which I mean in itself is is like wild, but everything about this is very wild. So like the idea was that like a clear distinction between like um, the male and female sex would be seen as a sign of racial superiority. And uh, yeah, then like white cis men and white cis women were like seen as models of, of that distinction. But uh, yeah, in the early 20th century, actually this, this model, like this biological justification of colonialism was starting to fall apart, where like more and more biologists uh, were like advocating for a like more flexible understanding of how sex works. And we're even going so far as to propose that all humans are intersex to a certain degree, where it's like sex also isn't as fixed um, as we often still see it today. And so, like, yeah, this clear distinction, this like understanding of um, how the white white race is uh, supposedly superior was like becoming unstable. And then somebody uh, called John Money, um, a U.S. physician, actually came up with this concept of gender, gender identity, and gender roles in order to like restabilize this category category where he was like okay even if we do have for example intersex children that are also white um like we should not think of that as as like a somehow mix between the, the sexes but like those children still can be clearly assigned a gender role and a gender identity and then we just have to like fix them through surgery and through hormones and then we have like restabilized um the the white race in its like binary sex model so like originally gender came from this like desire to to stabilize um, yeah the the category of the bin like the binary categories of sex and i mean later gender was appropriated by feminists to like point out that this like presumably biological determinism was like flawed and that uh that actually this is like a political and an ideological like category and that we can like, question that and then we can that you can like move away from that but uh, yeah that was the origin like it came from this desire to preserve the like presumed superiority of um, the white race and then like basically it was used to pathologize people of color where it was like in white intersex children this idea was like we can fix them we can give them a gender role and identity and then they are fixed but uh, intersex and gender nonconforming and trans people of color were seen as like proof that uh, their respective like races were, were inferior. So like from the very beginning, um, this was like a very, very strong like racist project, very strongly racist project. And uh, yes, yeah, so also in the, in the like process of then spreading that throughout the colonized uh, countries, a lot of cultural diversity regarding gender was destroyed because there was this idea of like, okay, in order to civilize these places, we have to um, like put everybody into this binary like model of, uh, of gender roles. And uh, yeah, so basically now we have this whole legacy of that where we still have a lot of non-consensual surgeries on intersex kids where this is basically still like one-to-one -one the same understanding of like when, when you have an intersex child you need to pick a gender identity for that child as soon as possible you need to fix them before they can even make decisions so um that is like the, the like weird irony of like having this non-consensual surgeries on children that cannot make decisions and then the same kind of surgeries when you want it as an adult you have to jump through all kind of hurdles to get it and uh yeah sorry i lost my thread for a moment Oh, I also wanted to point out that like a lot of this information I got from um, a book report from one specific book, which is called Histories of the Transgender Child by Julian Gill uh, Patterson. And the book report is by Alok Vedmanan. I can highly recommend this. Um, it's like really insightful and clear on like how the intersex struggle and the trans struggle and the racist struggle, anti-racist struggle are highly related. And it's like really infuriating because then you can see that today we often have this rhetoric that is like turning all of this upside down where like Western countries, like like Western countries are presented as this kind of progressive haven, like what Emma just said of like the Netherlands as this like model country of like, yes, here trans people are safe and can get care. Um, and then you have this like 
racist portrayal of other places where it's like yeah and there like you would be killed for being who you are but like the um the fact that this is like you to um yeah i i think we can link the the book later in the event like the fact that this is due to colonization that like a lot of cultures had like a lot more gender diversity before colonialism came along and destroyed all of that and that like a lot of the animosity that trans and queer people face today in like African countries and like Asian countries and South American countries that that's due to like the, the heritage, like uh, the legacy of colonialism, like that's often like put under the table and that's really, um, yeah, very racist and very, very troubling. Yes, and I think that's like one of the major points where you can see that, uh, that gender is highly related to other kinds of oppression, like that you can like trace it back to these kinds of projects. But um, yeah, I think also this way of looking at trans transgender identity today as what you also said, Emma, is this like individual problem, like where it's, oh, you, you have a body that is wrong and that needs fixing, or like there's a mismatch between your body and your mind, that it's framed like that rather than a systemic issue where I mean, like the, the kind of gender models that we have now, like rigid gender binaries um, are like basically oppressive for everyone. Like even if you are a cis man or a cis woman, then you're still highly restricted by those models because they do prescribe a very specific idea of production and reproduction. So everybody would profit from abolishing that and moving on from that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's also like tying in a lot with every other discourse we have on bodies that are somehow wrong and need to be fixed. So this entire question of like which bodies are good and desirable and which bodies should be changed and which bodies should not be changed and for which reasons and what do we do with bodies that are maybe wrong but cannot be changed. So in that way, there are a lot of parallels also to ableist discourse, to anti-fat uh, bias, to um, yeah, still racist discourse, which is also still so much about telling people that their bodies are wrong and um, yeah. I think uh, like I'm, I could like talk about this for hours, but I think Emmy also had a couple of things to say about this. Yeah, thanks, Lynn, for the historical summary and analysis. That was really nice. Um, I mean, not nice content, but you summarized it really well. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of contemporary examples, actually, um, about how you know uh, oppression of trans bodies is also connected to other struggles. Um, under capitalism, but un also under a cis heteropatriarchal system. And so, um, as some of you might have heard, for example, with the Olympics lately, uh, two Namibian women were cisgender women, I might add, um, were banned from participating because their testosterone levels were too high. And I think this is a very clear example of how, um, you know, like you just said, um, inf strict enforcement of gender roles and expectations of gender and sexual characteristics is very harmful um, to everyone. It's also deeply connected to racism and what do we see then as a woman's body or a man's body in any case, but also to misogyny. Um, you know, why does a level of testosterone have to affect whether or not you're placed in a woman's category, regardless of whether you're cis or trans? Um, and another example I wanted to mention as well is uh, deportations of queer and trans people in European countries. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2019, British Airways was the official sponsor of London Pride and were leading the Pride March. Um, but at the same time, it's their airline company that has been deporting uh, refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants, um, be they, yeah, be they cis or trans, but um, especially in this context, you know, deporting trans people who are fleeing to a European country to seek asylum, um, where Europe is kind of supposedly tolerant and accepting of queer and LGBT um, people to then be deported because they're not believed about their gender, about their sexuality. Um, it's a double standard and I think it shows inherent racism in the system as well. So it's definitely connected there too. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, those are some great examples. Um, and I also uh, myself just found it striking how the kind of homophobic discourse that was rampant um, what around like the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, <laughs> 90s, um, um, 
is really similar to the kind of turf discourse that's going on right now in the UK, where the kind of same slogans like, oh, but protect the children are being used to kind of to just discriminate against trans people, which that slogan was once used to discriminate against um, queer people. Um, and I was wondering, Emmy, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on the UK context, since the gender critical movement is gaining steam there. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'll just start off maybe giving a bit of context on the healthcare system, especially gender based healthcare in the UK. Um, so we have about five uh, gender identity clinics around the country, uh, all with extremely long waiting lists. Um, and actually, especially if you're non binary, a few of those clinics are unadvised to go to because kind of similar to what Lane was talking about earlier, like um, you are forced to prove so much that you are kind of a different gender than people assume you are. Um, and that's quite a detriment if you're non-binary because a lot of people feel forced to, or even are forced to um, really lean into like medical transitioning um, and especially binary um, transitioning. So it just ends up uh, resulting in I mean, a very harmful system, but also really long waiting queues, um, exceptionally long. Um, I was signed up to a, a waiting list for two years by the time that I thought this isn't worth it. Um, and yeah, cancelled, to be honest. Um, and like Leanne said, you can't really express any questions, any doubts, because that will be um, that will become an obstacle in your portfolio, so to speak. Um, so. Um, there was hope because a few years ago, there was a public consultation on a renewal of the Gender Recognition Act, um, which would have allowed trans people to self-identify as trans instead of having to jump through loops with various psychologists and doctors. Um, so a public, public nationwide consultation happened. Anybody was allowed to fill it in, um, kind of to give advice on this topic. Uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting that that was made specifically public because then you have a lot of um, cis people, a lot of transphobic people giving their opinions uh, on what trans people can do with their bodies. But um, it's also good because it gave a lot of people the opportunity, trans people, the opportunity to express themselves and be heard by a commission on this. Um, and especially a lot of um, established LGBT and trans groups like Stonewall, um, like Mermaid's Charity, a lot of them were key players in the act and like filled it in and shared it and were asked for advice. Um, all to no avail though, the act was given up um, despite being overwhelmingly for uh, self-ID um, because it was too contra controversial. So it was just abandoned, um, no follow-up, nothing. So that's kind of the hopeless situation that, um, that trans people who want to access gender-based care are facing. And then, like you said, uh, in addition to that, there's the whole cultural discourse surrounding um, trans existence in the UK. Um, for some reason, I mean, you can speculate about why, but uh, like you said, the turf movement or um, gender critical, so-called gender critical movement is really big in the UK, um, bigger than a lot more countries. Um, and yeah, th their whole uh, shtick is to kind of um, enforce the idea that trans people don't exist, you know, that trans women are actually just men who want to gain access to women's spaces. Um, and the focus is especially on trans women. Um, it's very misogynistic. And yeah, I think a part of it stems out of the second wave feminism um, movement, which was also big in the UK as well. Um, because there was like this idea to set up specifically women's spaces, um, which in itself is not a problem, you know, but then uh, now it's being used and it's a real shame that feminism is being used to oppress trans people like that. Um, something I wanted to link it to though, actually, is that this turf movement is really being used um, by the conservative party, I would say, or by the right wing um, or right leaning movement more generally. And it's, it, we have to connect it to other movements that are happening in the UK as well. I mean, I was really shocked the other day to open my social media and find a, a national video of children singing this new um, 
anthem that's been created with waving union flags and in, in, uh, union flags in the background uh, called One Britain, One Nation. So now we have a national day called One Britain, One Nation Day. Um, kids are encouraged to sing the song. Uh, it's very strange. Um, union Jacks are everywhere. They're, they've become popular to have in the background of all national state news broadcast as well, um, especially um, when political figures are asked to speak on the news. Um, it's almost obliged now that they have a Union Jack flag in the background. Uh, this is obviously also connected to Brexit. I think the UK is losing a lot at the moment um, in terms of uh, in the economy, but also um, in terms of diplomacy. And there's this, this constant force feeding of patriotism going on, um, kind of in response to that. So growing deportations, also EU citizens as well, um, and, and growing nationalism. So I definitely wanted to link those two things. Um, I think they're being used to divide uh, resistance. I think they're being used to divide the working class and encourage the scapegoating of minorities as well. Um, one final thing I wanted to touch upon, uh, it's a little bit different, but I was talking to Laura Miles about this, who is a um, quite a well-renowned trade unionist and trans activist in the UK the other day, and we, we published uh, an interview with her in The Socialist, which you can um, read in June's paper. One interesting thing she said, you know, I asked why we talked about kind of Great, Great Britain as a whole in connection with um, Ireland and Scotland, and I asked um, I asked her why she thinks that Ireland, for example, which is a socially conservative country, a more religious country um, than the UK, it's, it's Catholic. Um, I asked her why trans liberation, trans rights, access to trans healthcare are much more pro progressive in Ireland than they are since the 1800s. So the level of resistance and struggle is just really, really low. And I think that's also contributing to the situation right now. Yeah, I think that's all I, I wanted to say on the topic. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Amin. Any other points on that, Lane? Okay, then uh, I wanna move on to the last kind of topic for, for this panel. Um, and that is um, about the need uh, for a socialist approach uh, to trans liberation. And Emmy, like you said, you spoke to Laura Miles about this. Um, could you uh, explain a little bit more what this exactly means? Sure. So I think I have kind of three main points um, about this. The first one um, is that I guess an alternative to a socialist approach would be to go via the parliamentary system and by, by reform. Um, you know, reform has in a, in a way delivered us a lot of things and it's easy to be duped by it. It's delivered us um, same sex marriage. It's another, it's a whole nother question about whether that's um, kind of necessary or desirable. Um, but we've, we can see that reform has, has got us some, in some ways um, in terms of protection for not being fired from your job based on your um, sexual orientation or gender identity as well, for example. Um, but socialism teaches us that reform is never permanent. Um, and liberation, kind of like a, uh, a linear development towards liberation is not an inherent part of the system. Uh, like you said in the intro, Emma, we can see this happening in, in Hungary, in Poland, in the US, places where certain rights had been protected or at least um, yeah, socially and culturally established, if not legally yet, and they're being revoked. I mean, in the US, as a concrete example, um, one of the first things Trump did when he came into office was to ban trans people from joining the military and to um, reverse protections on not being fired from a job and not being able to rent a place to live if you are LGBT. And um, what I mean to say by this ultimately is that, you know, we, can, we can't count on reform to protect us because it can, it can always be reversed. And in a system like capitalism where liberation for people and liberation for everyone it's not an inherent part of the system. It's not secure. Whereas socialism would say, you know, these tenets are integral to the way that we would govern. Um, it's not in term, it's not part of policy or, or or like something to be added after discussion. No, they are, they're non-negotiables. Um, 
Something else I would like to talk about is representation. I think it's very easy nowadays to slip into a liberal mindset of, oh, but if we just elect enough trans people, if we just elect enough uh, queer people, enough feminists, uh, enough, enough women, we will, um, we will get liberation, we'll get equality. Um, and although representation of historically oppressed voices is essential, um, yeah, it's essential that we hear these people, it's not the end goal in itself. Um, some concrete examples, for example, Caitlyn Jenner, um, she's trans, uh, she's actually running to be a representative uh, in the next local elections, I think, um, and she recent, she's said many harmful things about trans people over the years. Um, one of the most recent in the whole debate around whether trans girls should play in sports, in girls sports, even in schools, um, her opinion is that they should not be allowed to partake in girl sports and that's really harmful I mean not just to these trans girls specifically but to trans people as a whole as being seen being seen as the gender that they are and as um kind of promoting social acceptance of trans people so that's really harmful and if we would say you know well if we just elect all the Caitlyn Jenners of the world will achieve trans liberation well that's clearly not going to happen you can also see this in the Netherlands with the D66 candidate, for example, who's trans, I forget her name, but she's used a lot as kind of an example of, oh, well, D66 is trans inclusive because they have someone who's trans, but D66 does a lot of shady stuff. Um, and an example from the UK, also linking it back to our earlier discussion of um, connections to other struggles, is a racism commission that was set up um, last year to investigate whether any structural racism exists in the UK. And the commission was made fully out of people of color and black people and yet they happen to find that there is no structural racism in the uk at all it does not exist um which is clearly not true i mean there, there are findings that you know black people and people of color in the uk are discriminated in housing in jobs in um economically by the police um so just having the representation it's it's not enough um it's not a guarantee and then the final thing that i wanted to point out is that um, single issue fights uh, will, net, will only get us so far. So this is something I also spoke to Laura Miles about. And I mean, it's great that we have, I, I don't want to kind of, um, how do you say that? I don't want to detract from the importance of single issue fights. I think they're really important in providing space for people to fight for, um, for their own identities and for you know, to, to be, to, for their voices to be heard. Um, so think of, for example, um, yeah, a, a pride march that only focuses on uh, LGBT uh, liberation without focusing on anything else or about um, a Black Lives Matter kind of movement that would uh, then ignore um, trans liberation or, or queer liberation. You know, they are important, but it will only get us so far because if you're only fighting for one, uh, one person's identity you're not gonna you're not gonna change things for people I mean who have that identity plus another one if we're talking in terms of intersectional oppression um, but you're not going to liberate the working class as a whole and you're not going to liberate the oppressed people as a whole and you're not going to change the system actually um, you're just going to achieve reform which is kind of what I talked about earlier um, and the final thing, which I guess you'll also maybe talk about, Emma, and we can talk about in the discussion as well, is that oppression will always exist under capitalism. It's an integral part of the system. It's what the system was designed for. Um, capitalist, capitalism wouldn't work without oppression. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I wanna say about this topic. Thanks so much, Emmy. I also had some points to add here, but I think you covered most of what I wanted to say. But I just wanted to highlight um, one aspect of it, really relating it back to practically our kind of struggle in the Netherlands. Um, because I think what you've just said at the end is really important how um, oppression is, is uh, inherent to capitalism. And that's also what Lane touched on earlier about how the kind of the like the so-called abjection or degradation of certain bodies is kind of used to distribute like exploitation and oppression amongst people. And within capitalism, the family unit is very important for that, right? And within the family unit, gender norms are used to justify the kind of exploiting of 
a lot of extra labor from uh, women uh, through their labor in the household that's not compensated. Um, and this, this kind of analysis of how capitalism works, I think helps us understand something really important about the fight against transphobia. Um, because it shows us that um, kind of much of the uh, much of the exclusion and violence that uh, trans people face, um, it's not only uh, it's not only um, it's, it does not only materialize in these kind of formal institutions like healthcare, but more also in a cultural kind of arena in the family, in in schools, in classrooms, in in the workplace, and I think that. When we uh, when we learn this, um, it becomes clear that while it is right now a practical necessity for trans people, um, for their well-being, to fight for the transformation of the healthcare system, simply because this is a satisfaction of a base need, um, we shouldn't conceive of this as the end goal of our struggle, right? Because this would amount to a kind of reformism, like you said. Um, you know, in our analysis, if you don't get rid of capitalism, the gains that can be that will be made for oppressed groups are always insecure and they can always be taken away again. Uh, so what we should strive for is a socialist world in which wage labor doesn't exist and the nuclear family is not the main unit of survival. Um, and the eradication of these more more broadly spread institutions, I think, is necessary really practically necessary to end trans oppression once and for all, also in the formal institutions like healthcare. And I think, just like you said, Emmy, um, really practically what this means is that we have to relate uh, all, all the struggles that the working class faces uh, together to one another, uh, relate all the struggles of the oppressed people in order to use the power that we have when we do come together to fight for a better world. Um, and that's just what I wanted to add, uh, finally. Um, are there any then last contributions uh, from one of you? No? Then I want to thank you so much, uh, Emmy and Lane, for um, these great insightful perspectives that you shared with us. And with that, we're going to head into the discussion. So if you want to join the discussion in Zoom, you can sign up through the form in the Facebook event, and I think you can still get a link. Um, and also, if you want to get involved with the Transorg Nu uh, movement, you can find them on Instagram. And if you want to get involved with us, the International Socialists, we have active branches throughout the country that organize regular meetings uh, like this one and uh, more stuff. You can find us on Facebook or on our website, uh, Socialisme dot new to get in touch with us um, and then to everyone who is watching the live stream uh, good night and to everyone else uh, we will head into the discussion <laughs>